Imagine that you are at a gallery and it's exhibition opening night. The art gallery is full of people dressed in their finest clothes. They are sipping seemingly expensive uh, white wine from uh, little glasses. Uh, and you're there. You are the artist. And you're there to unveil your newest work. Much anticipation passes through the crowd as you reveal it. And it is, sorry, dramatic pause here, this. A blank slate. You hear disapproving noises through the audience. A blank slate, come on, that was done in the 1920s. Uh, the, isn't it a bit late now to question the nature of art, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 you explain. No, 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 no. No, it's not finished. You see, it's, it, this is just the beginning. The point of this work is that you're going to paint it. And so the artist points to a person in the audience and asks the person in the audience to come up and to paint the canvas. Now, what would make this interesting for the person in the audience? How would you react if you were that person who was called up to, to paint? I wouldn't know what to paint. Yeah. And it would be, I think, a little bit intimidating with a bit of the art crowd hanging around looking at you painting. And I, isn't this why we have professional artists? You know, the people who have like educations and skills and so on. Okay, so one thing the artists, you, the artist, could do to make this um, easier for the audience to participate in is that you might invite more of them up. Say, okay, you four, why don't you paint this canvas? And that sounds a little bit less intimidating because um, now there are four people sharing there and nobody can point at that brushstroke and say that was your fault. Um, but still, you're just basically asking people to make your art for you. But let's say your work is actually in the experience of those four people. You could try to improve it by being very selective about giving them particular and interesting tools. You know, one thing is a tiny little brush that requires a lot of precision. One thing is like if you have a huge brush. And maybe it would be even more fun to be asked to paint the painting if you were given this. Uh, and the artist, you the artist, could further go on and um, give people palettes with ready mixed colors. Different colors can give very different paintings. Just imagine what you could do with palette number eight there as opposed to palette number 18. Is it correct to call you the artist now? You're controlling the environment wherein they're painting, you're controlling the palette. Maybe you give them a little crash course in advance, like five minutes. This is how you paint. Maybe you guide them. You know, maybe you've already worked a bit with the canvas. <coughs> now there are some fields to be filled. Maybe you play heavy metal music, very loud, as they paint. Maybe for every brushstroke they make, you reinforce it by having a violinist there, playing the violin in the same tune as, as their brush strokes. Maybe uh, you hold their hands as they paint. And basically you are painting, you're just using somebody else's hand as a brush. Maybe you ask them to compete. Who can fill the canvas with color the quickest? Are there any further suggestions to what you could do beyond this? Mm. Yeah, one word like blue or egg or postmodernism. Mm. Yep. I was thinking, ask one participant to think of something and then describe it on to the next one and see like how many stages you can describe it in terms of things. Mm. Yeah, so it would pass uh, the whispering game kind of. Mm. To read poems by heart while painting. Aha. Mm -hmm. And if you're reading the poems by, by heart while you're painting, you don't have time to worry about those people out there staring, do you? That's, that's, that's beginning to sound like an interesting work. And now, hmm? yeah. Dance while painting. Hmm? Dance while painting. 
dance while painting. Okay, I, I would freak out with that because I'm a bad dancer, but <laughs> but it would certainly be interesting. So you can give them uh, the, some fun costumes. Mm. Because when you paint in a costume, it's much different from when you paint just as you Yeah, and then also it, the crowd out there is not very threatening anymore because you are hidden. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh. kind of like a charade. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, now we are thinking as LARP designers. And that's of course the point of this, uh, the point of this metaphor. Uh, because quite often when we see people coming into LARP design from background in writing, uh, in uh, cinema, directing and so on, the first impulse is to design the details. Or I want this scene with these people exactly like that. And that's not an impulse that works very well for LARP design. But this, okay, we have an empty space and we have some people who are going to fill it. And we can manipulate the tools they use. We can tell them why, we can give them aid on the way, but ultimately they are the people filling it, uh, is the way we tend to think about LARP design. And I've taken a bunch of stuff here and put it under a single headline, input. Uh, and now we're over in the world of LARP design. Uh, because input is everything you feed to your players. Uh, it, input is the way you talk when you introduce them to the LARP. Input is the written character they might get. Input is the workshop you have in advance. Input is uh, the scenography of the room you are in, the sound you're playing, uh, the purpose you tell them, the reason we're, do we're doing this, the reasons they are doing this that you discuss with them. Everything we do ultimately is input to the players are going to create the final work. But there are two things uh, that underlie all of this. Two kinds of input that we must have, is my claim. One of them is that the players need a language to interact. And the point of a language is that you share it. That was a language I just made up. It doesn't help us interact at all because uh, not even I understand it, right? Uh, so, we need some shared assumptions why we're here. Well, we, the four of us are going to paint this canvas while dancing. Okay, now we have a shared language because we understand that we're going to dance and that's the purpose of dancing and we're going to paint the canvas. And so, when somebody else begins dancing and painting the canvas, it makes sense to me within the context of the game. Uh, and the other thing we need to have uh, the language is a very broad term here. There are many things that could be part of the language to interact. But the other thing we must have, if you remember the, that scary audience that are looking at you while you're painting, is we need an alibi to play. Adults in our cultures uh, mostly don't play or don't play in very obvious ways. Um, it's not really okay in a generic social situation to engage in very playful behavior. Haha, -ha, I'm a knight, there's a dragon, I shall slay the dragon! No, I, I can't do that in a meeting at my job. Um, so you need uh, some way of, uh, of assuring the participants that it's okay to play. And this term alibi, I think it came from Bjelke? Yep. Uh, but I, originally, of course, it's uh, in the murder investigations. You know, if, if you were seen at the theater at 20.00, you could not have been at home at 20.00, where the murder took place, so you have an alibi. Uh, a good reason to believe you're innocent, but of course, what they don't know is that you have a twin brother. <laughs> it looks exactly the same as it was at the theater at the time. But alibi is basically the, the excuse we have. Um, one kind of alibi is that there is a fairly authoritarian games master who tells you, now, you, adults, Play, because I, with my inherent authority in this situation, uh, I order you to do so. We've got some other examples of alibi from earlier. A costume provides a certain alibi. I wear different clothes, I'm a different person. A kind of unspoken agreement amongst the participants that uh, what happens now is play. Uh, it does not reflect on me as a person, like afterwards. You know, if I play, behave like a total jerk, then it's okay, uh, because afterwards we'll be friends and you won't think I'm a jerk. Um, and so on. There are many things that can be said about alibi. Well, the one thing I want to leave you with is remember to provide it. Let's see. 
Yeah. So further on, LARPwrites use a great number of tools and you'll be learning a lot of those tools uh, that we use in LARP design uh, during this week. And there will be many more tools that can be discovered by reading and participating in LARPs. And people keep, keep coming up with new tricks, new ways of designing LARPs, new clever little solutions for LARP design. But very broadly, I tend to divide these tools into two groups. The frame tools, which is input that is given to all the players. So if I, if I say to you, okay, you are soldiers and this is the Napoleonic War. I'm using a frame tool because I'm giving the same instructions to all of you. If I'm uh, painting all the walls in this room, I'm using a frame tool because we are all interacting with the same sonography. Uh, if I'm holding a workshop that you all participate in that will help you find your character, I'm still using a frame tool because I'm telling all of you how to do this workshop. If on the other hand I tell you that you your name is Maurice and you joined, uh, you volunteered for the army just three weeks ago. Now I'm onto the canvas. I've started painting a little bit for you. I've started telling you something about who you individually are. Also, if I say the five of you over there, uh, you are actually spies for uh, Britain. Uh, I'm talking to you as a group, but I'm not talking to everybody. I'm also using a canvas tool. Uh, and this duality keeps popping up, I think. Hmm. It keeps popping up in different discussions about LARP design. Uh, a lot of things you can say to people about the, the frame, uh, instructions given to everybody, is which world are we in? We are in 2015 at Ruta, or we are in 1814 uh, at, uh, in Belgium. Uh, we can talk about the society they live in. Uh, we can talk about the duration of play. Uh, and there are lots of other ways of classifying these tools, just to be clear about that. We can make sonography, ambient sound, uh, the way we do pre-brief and workshops, and so on. And on the canvas side of things, we find tools like describing your personality. You're a very jolly person, or you're angry and bitter, and you drink lots of coffee. Uh, your character's life story, the motivation that drives you, goals, groups, friends, and enemies, and so on, and so on. Um, LARPs can be classified. You'll encounter different kinds of LARPs, and some are very heavy on the frame tools. Uh, I tend to call those systemic LARPs, or systemic LARP designs, where you don't really need to talk to individual players much or instruct individual players much. You can handle 30 or you can handle 60 because you're giving the same instructions to all of them. And I think later today we'll be playing New Voices in Art, and I think that's a pretty good example of our systemic design. Uh, while on the canvas only side of things, um, you could say Family Anderson, which has individual characters and so on, has a great deal of work done on the canvas. Um, but the pure canvas-only LARP, the one where the designers don't worry about the frame at all, is usually part of the tr tradition. Like this weekend, we're going to play in the same world, the same characters, uh, using the same rules in the same situations as last weekend. Uh, now it's our turn to organize. Of course, most LARPs use a bit of both kinds of tools. Uh, but they can vary in different spots on the scale. So there's this word, the para book, which is like the cover of the book and the uh, numbers on the pages, but not the actual text of the book. And so the term popped up, I think it was Jock who proposed it, of the paralarp. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, the paralarp, which um, is everything about the larp except the actual playing which is all the activities we do before, all the activities we do afterwards, everything around. And LARP designers tend to actually, I mean, the, the name LARP design is actually misleading because what we tend to design is the paralarp. The character texts, the instruction booklets, the pre-brief, the workshop, all that kind of stuff. And during the, during the LARP, there are tools for meddling with the LARP as it is being played. This can be done, uh, but that's not where the main emphasis of LARP design tends to be. So here, here's the slide uh, I want you to remember. This is um, Orson Welles, famous movie director, controls every part of his movies in detail, um, often plays the main character and so on. Uh, he's not a LARP designer. That's not the LARP design mindset. I tried beginning at the summer school three years ago to subdivide and classify all the different tools that LARP designers use. 
Um, you don't need to remember this slide because I'm arriving at the point. Uh, and when I made this classification of all the different tools that people work with, I tried to see, okay, some ex actual examples. Some actual examples of LARPs and LARP designs. And I find that they very often don't work with all of this stuff. I mean, this is all the information that the player could possibly have in their head about where they are and why they are there and what they're doing there and, and how they arrived at this knowledge. Uh, but very few LARPs bother to work with all of these pieces of information. Instead, they often work with one, two, three, perhaps, uh, tools. They talk a lot about character, or they, or they talk a lot about world. Um, they are, are big on workshops, and they're big on techniques, but they don't talk a lot about the characters in the society they live in. Uh, and use these simple tools to inform the rest of the LARP. I'll give you one example. You tell the players that this is a murder mystery LARP. That's um, six words. This is a murder mystery LARP. And the players then know a number of things because they've watched murder mystery movies, they've read murder mystery novels, and it's all around in our culture. There will be a murder. The point of the game is to figure out the identity of the murderer. Characters tend to be witty and polite towards each other. You shouldn't reveal your knowledge until you've caught the murderer. All of these are implications of the idea that we're going to a murder mystery LARP. Uh, all contained in six words. So you're actually given a lot of information with those six words. Or you could tell someone that their character is a hard-boiled detective. And the player will make the assumption, aha, I'm a hard-boiled detective. In what kind of world are there hard-boiled detectives? Well, in murder mysteries. And so all the other stuff follows from that. So trying to summarize that, LARP designers control the parallel through carefully selected input that allows for emergent content and are utilized as the participants' tacit knowledge of the world to inspire and enable play. Or uh, find a few pieces of information and work with them. This is why I love LARP design, because ultimately all LARP design is acting on the mind of the player, which is to say that when we design LARPs, we need to think carefully about human beings, how we behave, especially as groups, especially as we interact with each other. Uh, everything we know about human beings from psychology, from sociology, from lived experience, uh, daily life and so on, is applicable to LARP design. And unlike, uh, say, uh, a writer of fiction, for example, who applies his knowledge or her knowledge of human beings to the characters in the novel, we get to see how actual real people interpret that input. And that can often be surprising and illuminating. So a LARP design process, um, it often begins with an idea. Somebody comes and says, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we did that? And I say we and group because for some reason, almost every LARP is designed by a group of people. There are very few individuals that design and execute LARPs all by themselves. So somebody says, wouldn't it be cool if we had like a Wild West LARP? And enough people agree that, yeah, okay, let's make this LARP Wild West LARP. The next thing is that you sit down and you dis discover that half of the team is now imagining an 1850s historically accurate LARP where everybody spends three weeks hand sewing their costumes and reads up on the period uh, language, while the other half of the group are imagining kind of guns and uh, cowboys and uh, shootouts. So then you have to agree, you have to agree what that means, both to yourself as a design team and to the players. Uh, and then you come to the actual design phase. This is where all the difficult questions are asked. Okay, so we want this historically accurate Western shootout LARP. How do we get the shootouts to happen? How, what parts of history do we emphasize? All of that. And that's what we'll be spending a lot of time talking about. And from choosing which tools you want to work with, how you're going to realize this vision of a LARP, uh, you end up actually having to execute those decisions. Characters need to be written if you're writing characters. Workshops need to be planned. Uh, advertisements need to be made to recruit players to have the right attitude to play this particular LARP. And then finally there is the LARP. You begin with a pre-brief, you uh, prepare the players. Uh, you might do workshops and drama exercises, stuff like that. There's the LARP itself. We, okay, the vision is happening, or it's not. 
Uh, there's never a lot without some surprises. And then in the end you have the debrief, um, where players sit down and talk about uh, and process what they experienced. Now, there's an elephant uh, here. Uh, and uh, you know the expression elephant in the room. There is an elephant in this school because a lot of this stuff will be touched on by different lectures and LARPs and activities held this week. Uh, but there's one thing that's super important for a successful LARP that nobody will be talking much about, and that's production. You need funding, you need budgets, you need accounting, uh, you need a plan to handle the fact that people uh, tend to go to the toilet and uh, shit needs to be disposed of and people tend to get hungry and they need to get food and people get, tend to get thirsty and all of this stuff. And the reason there isn't that much talk about that is that this is general project management skills and general event planning skills. So they're not that particular to LOP, but that doesn't mean they're not important. Uh, and if you're particularly interested in production, there are a lot of people around here who have a lot of hands-on experience. So if you're thinking of like, uh, let's fill a square with rubbish and rubbish and turn that into a LARP, there are people who can give you advice on how to do that. And of course, this here is an ideal LARP design process. It's nice little boxes from idea to vision to detail and so on. In reality, it tends to look a lot more like this. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, sometimes you work on a character and you realize that the premise for your LARP, your vision, there was something wrong there, something that needs rethinking. Sometimes you start writing, working on characters before you really know what the LARP is about, and you write characters to discover what the LARP is about, and that's also okay. But when you're in this mess of like, okay, uh, and this finalizing this character and making that decision about the pre-brief seem equally important, uh, there are tools that can help guide. And quite a lot of those tools will be taught here later on, especially the mixing desk of LARP, which is in a way an overview of some very common questions that have no clear or correct answers and that LARP designers keep encountering in LARP and LARP for LARP in this tradition. Thank you. <laughs>